Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we're here to watch Jurassic Park and hear about the, uh, the real life uh, work on, on making something quite a lot like Jurassic Park. Um, I received Ben Mesrick's book uh, just a couple days ago, or about a week ago in the mail, and I was very excited. Uh, I hit the index right away, because this book takes a deep dive on a bunch of stuff that I cover. Um, uh, gene editing, organoids, all kinds of interesting technologies that come together in this project to create potentially uh, a real w woolly mammoth. So Ben, um, you're the author of a couple of books um, that are bestsellers, have both been made into movies, um, Bringing Down the House about the MIT Blackjack Club, um, Accidental Billionaires about Facebook became the social network. So tell me a little bit about what's your MO for finding these stories, turning them <laughs> sure. into bestsellers. Sure, so and, uh, you know, normally people pitch me stories. Um, ever since 21 came out, I become the go-to guy for every time a group of smart people do something crazy <laughs> or bad. But I'm looking for stories that are sort of larger than life, that are on the edge of, of you know, science or something you know, that, that pushes the boundaries. This story was very different for me. This was the first book in my career that I actually chased after. I had heard, uh, you know, I've been obsessed with woolly mammoths, as many of us are, from childhood. I remember seeing one in the Museum of Natural History and thinking something like that couldn't actually exist. Um, and then I heard about George's project uh, a year and a half or a couple years ago, and I said, I really, really want to figure this out. So I just shot an email out of the blue um, and said, can I come talk to you? And, uh, and that's where it all started. George, so... Uh since we're going to be watching Jurassic Park, apparently what they do in Jurassic Park to recreate the dinosaurs isn't that far from what you're thinking about in your lab. So let us know, or tell us what happens in Jurassic Park and sort of how much of that is reality and then what are you doing uh, for the mammoth? Yeah, there, there are some surprising uh, similarities. Uh, since there are other parts of de-extinction, as it's sometimes called, that where you might have something frozen away somewhere and you can kind of cheat by getting it out of the freezer. Um, what the more general way is if you can find ancient DNA. And ancient DNA now goes back to 700,000 years. And one thing that we have in the bag, we, don't, we, we haven't made a, uh, any extinct animal, but we have uh, gotten pretty good at reading ancient DNA. Um, and so 700,000 years is the limit, and so obviously Cretaceous and Jurassic animals are out of reach with current technology doesn't mean they will always be, uh, unless you guess at them based on what we know about developmental biology. Uh, another thing that, uh, so what we have in common though is going from ancient DNA in the computer to uh, a modern cellular structure where you kind of bootstrap up based on uh, you know, what, what's in the computer and you get to something that, that's alive. Another fascination that, that uh, Michael had and the, and the protagonist. Michael Crichton, the author. Of and, and, and the protagonists had were, was about safety. They were trying to be safe, uh, but they did two wacky things, uh, which I think uh, many uh, biology students would, would recognize. One of them was, was having only females uh, as, the, as their big safeguard against uh, spread. Uh, maybe only males would be a slightly better choice or, or just forget about that whole thing at all. And the other thing was, <laughs> Uh, as you'll, I'm not going to ruin it for you. Uh, you probably, you've probably all seen it a hundred times. But anyway, the other thing was they made them dependent upon an amino acid called lysine, as, as I recall. It's been a while since I've seen it. And, uh, and it turns out lysine is present in all foods. <laughs> so this is a major pl plot flaw, I would say. <laughs> But suffice it to say, we have now made things that are, uh, uh, living things that are dependent upon something that is not present in any foods uh, uh, called BIP-A, and that's what they should have done, maybe. But, <laughs> but we're, 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 we're capable of failing, too. So. But, but Ben's book actually starts with the last um, woolly mammoth yes. thing. Uh, it's a fictional uh, chapter, I guess. It's a looking ahead chapter. A looking ahead <laughs> chapter, okay. Yeah. The last woolly mammoth. Looking behind and ahead, it right. It looks out to sea, and, and someone is rowing ashore on Wrangell Island up the, in the north of Siberia, the last place where there was mammoths 2,000 right. years ago. Well, the mammoth, the, the end of the mammoth story is actually a really cool story. So most mammoths went extinct 12,000 years ago. But a small group of mammoths crossed an ice bridge in the Arctic Circle to a little island called Wrangell Island. Then the ice bridge melted, and that family of woolly mammoths lived for another 
8,000 years on this island um, until, well, there's a couple of possible ways they might have died. You know, uh, originally it was thought we then came and ate them too, um, but it might also have been genetic problems as they interbred and interbred. But essentially the last woolly mammoths were around while people were building pyramids. So the last woolly mammoth probably died around 3,000 years ago. So what, one of the interesting details in the book is, is where the cells come from. And so just let me lay the groundwork here. The, George's lab is starting with elephant cells, the closest living relative to the woolly mammoth, or a close living relative, and then using um, genetic engineering to kind of turn those into potentially mammoth cells. So where did you get the cells, and sort of what happens after that? What, what is the game plan going forward to get our mammoth? Yeah, so they are actually remarkably close to mammoths. They're closer to mammoths than they are to African elephants. And a lot of people think that African and Asian look pretty similar, but, and mammoths look very different, and it's true. Um, but genetically, they're much closer to, to, to uh, Asian elephants, uh, and uh, mammoths are much closer to each other. Uh, we, we have cells from a variety of different sources. Um, we have, uh, uh, from either African or Asian, we have skin cells, we have uh, endothelial cells, which are in the blood vessels, and we have placental cells, for example. And, and none of them so far have been really good at producing pluripotency, meaning ability to make stem cells, uh, which we take for granted in many other um, organisms of uh, scientific and agricultural significance. Well, well, how close are you to getting a mammoth, would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I think Ben, in the end of his book, uh, says about 100 years to get a, a whole. No, book. no, I said, I said three years, and then uh, Stuart Brand said 100 years, and then George said, sooner than you think. <laughs> so you can choose any of those three sooner answers. Sooner than Stuart thinks. Yeah. <laughs> right. full, full disclosure, I went online and I said never, so we, we'll see which one it is. <laughs> one thing that drew, drew my attention in the book was where the funding for this project came. It apparently came from Peter Thiel, who's famous for a lot of things, for being the first investor in Facebook. Right. Um, for suing Hulk, Hulk Hogan, for backing President Trump, and also backing the mammoths. So George tells us this story about how this funding from Peter Thiel kind of occurred. And by the way, when you mentioned that in your article, it went instantly viral. Um, I, know, I, I inadvertently have written two stories with Peter Thiel in it, not realizing that that would be something that would explode <laughs> in interest the way it has. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I've... I've known him for a while, I was having breakfast with him, and, I, and he, he said, give me your three craziest ideas, and I picked two of them that I thought would reson might resonate with him. One, one is reversing aging in uh, mice and dogs and of humans, and then one is a woolly mammoth, and then the third one was, uh, I can't remember the third. AI from it, uh, nerve cells. Uh, artificial intelligence by making uh, nerve cells in, in, in the lab. And I figured the first and the last would be the ones. And, uh, and he said, mammoth. So. <laughs> well, a lot of people are saying that you know, they wish there was more opportunities for scientists to, to get their craziest ideas funded. Oh. Apparently, it's not that um, <laughs> common. One thing that's really neat is it says right here on the cover of the book, this is now a major motion picture, or going to be. Yes. Um, Tell us about the movie. Sure. So um, Fox, 20th Century Fox, bought the project. And they actually bought it in when it was a proposal, so before I wrote the book. Um, a wonderful writer-director became attached. His name is Oscar Sharp, and he was up for a BAFTA last year for an amazing short film called The Carmen Line. Um, Oscar is a, a, a Brit who is kind of the next, they calling him the next a lot of things, so uh, Spielberg or Fincher or something. Um, it's being produced by Marty Bowen, who did Twilight and Maze Runner. Um, and it's moving very quickly at Fox, and he actually came out to Boston and, and hung out in your lab and followed you around, and they're already looking at pictures of actors who look like George, and uh, <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think things are going to move very quickly. So yes, it's going to be a, a really cool movie. What's been the, your contact with Hollywood like? I mean, any surprises uh, having uh, the film crew, the director in your lap? Um, well, uh, not, not, I mean, he's very thoughtful, and, and he, he really, Oscar puts a lot of work into it, much, I'm not going to say more than Ben, but, you know, a lot. And uh, my wife and I, Ting Wu, do a fair amount of interaction with uh, screenwriters in, uh, as part of our outreach to get science understood by a broad audience, or at least in, in that form. So 
wasn't our first interaction, but it was it was an extremely pleasant one. Yeah, and, I mean, and he works so hard at it, and he's so creative and fun. And the goal is to make the scientist the good guy. You know, in Jurassic Park, in a lot of movies, the scientist isn't always the good guy, or they're always making mistakes. And I think it's going to be great to see a, a story uh, with a positive scientific role in it, rather than rampaging woolly mammoths. Right. <laughs> Although I won't put anything past Hollywood. They're, they're, point, <laughs> they're at least not carnivores. Yeah. Right, right. There is something bad in, in the background of all this, is that the reason we need the mammoths, um, it relates to a second part of the book, which involves a father and son scientists in Siberia. Um, and so what are the, why do they need mammoths, and what is, right. uh, why do we need this you know, right. herd, herd, if that's And I'll, I'll give the, the dramatic Hollywood take, and then George can give you the reality. But um, I would say, to save the world, um, the, the massive tundra, which is essentially the ring of the world, is this massive land mass of, of permafrost. And the permafrost is a ticking time bomb. It contains within it more carbon than if we burned all the forests on Earth three times. And that permafrost is getting close to that tipping point of melting and, and essentially ending everything. These Russian scientists, the Zimovs, it's a father and son team, and it's really a family project, since the 80s have roped off an area of the Siberian tundra and created something called Pleistocene Park, where they're actually putting Pleistocene-era-like herbivores within this area, um, things like reindeer and American bison and Yakutian horses, and driving a tank up and down to mimic a mammoth. And what they've discovered is that by reintroducing this type of fauna, they can lower the temperature of the permafrost by as much as 20, 15 to 20 degrees, which is enormous if you look at climate change. So the reality is if you can reintroduce a herd of large Pleistocene era herbivores, you can actually save the tundra from melting. <laughs> uh, so that, I, I won't contradict any of that, uh, except that's 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, which you can almost double that to get to Fahrenheit. So it's a lot of uh, temperature. If, and it was, it's impressive as they did the experiment. It'd be nice mm -hmm. if somebody else repeats that experiment. Uh, but uh, this, their park looks nothing like what you'll see up there. <laughs> right. uh, it's, there's no glitz to it at all. It's very rough. Um, but, but they have done experiments, which is quite, uh, quite impressive. Right. And the process is, is that the mammoths knock down trees and things like that. Uh, the grassland grows, which actually reflects more sunlight. The snow gets punched uh, by the mammoths as they dig in roots so that the cold air can touch the, the, the frozen ground beneath. And it just becomes this cycle um, that actually just makes it cooler and cooler. And even if you don't consider this sufficient to solve global warming, at least it's in the right direction. It raises consciousness that we need other solutions as well, no doubt. Right. So it gets the question of how realistic the plan is. Um, it sounds far out, but the more you hear about it, the more it might uh, be plausible. Um, it's kind of like how, how realistic is it for you to turn off your lights and you know walk to the store. Um, every little bit helps uh, when we have a disaster. Right, but if, even if I don't turn off the lights when I leave my house, um, if there's mammoths, they're going to just do what mammoths do, which is stomp around the, the tundra. But I, it's a fact that the movie, the movie itself, you know, the budget of the movie is something like 800 times the budget of the project. Um, so <laughs> it would be nice if <laughs> it would be nice if it were the other way around, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, do we have any big uh, funders going to step in, maybe as a result of the book, do you think? Uh, I mean, I think that the book, the goal of the book, uh, other than to entertain and, and, and be exciting and everything, is to, to raise this, you know, thing. I look at the Woolly Mammoth Project as like the Moonshot Project. I mean, this is an outside-of-the-box, big story, big kind of thing that can get people thinking of interesting ways of dealing with our issues. And uh, I do think that it will bring a lot of attention to it and hopefully will bring funding. Um, but it'll definitely educate people both on this incredible revolution going in, on in bi biology. I mean, you know, one of the points of the book is that we've moved from reading our DNA or reading what makes us us to being able to write DNA. Um, and I think that's a massive changing moment in history that the majority of people don't really know that much about. And so I think a story like, you know, the same way Jurassic Park made us all want to be able to make dinosaurs, I think a, a story like this can get people really excited about this. So I do think that it could raise money. We'll see. We'll see what happens if the book gets out there. Right. I saw that in, in, in your book. You write, biology and genetics have gone from passive observation to sort of active creation. The mammoths is like a huge idea, but what else 
are you in your lab? What else are you working on? Like, what, is, what are the more, more pedestrian versions of, of creation that you're involved in? <laughs> pedestrian creation. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started. I mean, you know, it, it, it's um, gene drives to, uh, to, to get wild species like mosquitoes to be resistant to malaria, and hence the world resistant to malaria. Ways to make organisms that are resistant to all viruses, um, genetic by genetic manipulation. Ways that you can uh, engineer um, organoids that you mentioned, so you can do testing of new drugs and new therapies, gene therapies themselves, um, uh, doing genetic engineering in a way that doesn't involve moving genes from one organism to another, where you can just make small changes. There's many pedestrian. <laughs> Moonshots in there. <laughs> and so what, I mean, between the book and the movie about the mammoth resurrection, um, what kind of message do you think the public is going to get, or what kind of message are you trying to give and hope that the movie gives? I mean, a couple things. Them. One of them is, uh, you know, I grew up, uh, I, kind, I grew up kind of opposite of George. When you read the book, if you read the book, you'll see that George grew up with a, an incredible scientific mind surrounded by people who weren't scientists in a place where there wasn't, science and he had to go his own way. And I grew up in a world surrounded by scientists, but I was just really bad at it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. Um, my goal is to, I put scientists on a pedestal and I feel like with all the issues that we have in the world, the people who are gonna get us out of these issues are scientists. And I, I think that a story like this can open people's eyes to the idea that science done responsibly, um, done by people who are responsible, is what will make this world a better place and is what has made this world a better place in almost every issue we've ever had. And so you look at the woolly mammoth and, you know, we, kill, we killed the woolly mammoth. We ate the woolly mammoth as we did with the passenger pigeon, as we did with many extinct species. We ate them out of existence. Now we can actually put them back on this planet. And, uh, and who's going to do that? It's scientists. And so I, I don't know. I think that the messages are Science is where everyone should be pointing, and I also think that we can fix the things we've broken as long as we approach it uh, responsibly. Are you up to the task? <laughs> I think it's, it's a team effort that involves people all over the world, including the Zimovs and many others. So, yeah, I hope we are up to the task. Hopefully, at least up to the task of inspiring other people to, to consider it. Okay. Favorite scene in Jurassic Park before we wrap up? Wow, I mean, there's so many great scenes. I mean, you have to love the sort of life finds a way. You, I mean, you know. Uh, That's the motto in our lab, life finds a way. Right. right. I think uh, if, if, uh, if Jeff Goldman ends up in any movie, it's already a good movie. So <laughs> that's my opinion. But I love, I, love the, I love the, you know, I don't want to give, I mean, there's a few people who haven't seen it, I think, in this audience. So um, every scene in the movie is a fantastic scene. Raise your hand if you haven't seen Jurassic Park yet. See that? Look okay, at that. Quite a few. They're, they're, they're the smaller people. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Well, thanks to uh, <laughs> thanks thanks to Ben and George. Ben's book is outside. You can Thank you very copy. much. Yeah. Thank you.